It's being billed as the next big thing to replace fossil fuels and power our world. We're looking at it in industries, we're looking at it in people's homes. I'm talking about hydrogen. And when it comes to the future of clean energy, experts agree hydrogen is, well, pretty important. Even uh, what we call the hard to abate sector, namely steel or cement production, mm -hmm. Their hydrogen can, can play in the near future really a vital part in helping uh, those industries to decarbonize and, and reduce significantly their carbon footprint. We've discussed what hydrogen can be used for before on this podcast, and you can check out our other episodes. But today, we're going to be delving a bit deeper into how it's made and the less talked about but crucial parts of hydrogen, the color. Why? because it's the colour of hydrogen that indicates how cleanly it's been produced. So if it's coming from renewables, then you have white electrolysis and then it's green, and then if it's coming from fossil fuel, it's carbon capture and that's blue. So which colours of hydrogen will help the world get to net zero and where's it coming from? Today on the Energy Podcast, be it brown, grey, blue or green, why does the colour of hydrogen matter? When it comes to hydrogen, there's a veritable rainbow of colours used to classify the energy source used to make it. Typically, people use the colour definition to distinguish the way how hydrogen is made. But I mean, what matters in the end is really what is the carbon intensity of the hydrogen molecule that you produce. That's Nan Lu. She's Shell's licensing technology manager for Blue Hydrogen, and we're going to be hearing more from her a bit later on. As well as grey, blue and green, there's also brown hydrogen made from coal. And at the other end of the colourful spectrum, there's pink made from nuclear power, yellow made from solar and turquoise, which involves splitting methane into hydrogen and solid carbon or carbon black which is a useful raw material for things like car tyres and batteries. But before we get into that, let's head to Cologne in Germany, because it's a place really at the sharp end of the development in hydrogen. A new project called Refine One produces green hydrogen without greenhouse gas emissions, and it's the biggest of its kind in Europe. And Refine Two, which has an even bigger production capacity, is already underway. Shell's Frank Kieslik is in charge of the project. I want to just start at the basics. For people who may not know, tell us what green hydrogen is and how it's made. Green hydrogen is uh, the lowest carbon form of hydrogen and it's uh, being produced predominantly from or produced from renewable energy sources using then electrolysis to split the water into its element, and namely then hydrogen and oxygen. So it all starts with a renewable electricity uh, asset and uh, then the power that is uh, mainly coming from a wind farm or from a solar park is uh, connected to an electrolyzer like, like Refine One. And uh, this electrolyzer is then splitting up the water. So compared to today's still predominantly uh, grey hydrogen being produced uh, using carbon-based sources like natural gas, this green hydrogen has a much lower carbon footprint. So when hydrogen's talked about in, in the press or you know, in, in the media, it's often, as you said, talked about in the terms of boilers, uh, replacing gas boilers or, or long-distance transport and trucks. So that's a kind of familiar use for it. But I wonder what it could also be used for. Yeah. So I think one, one of the big um, targets in the foreseeable future is uh, to replace a hydrogen already being used, but based on, on traditional ways of producing it. So the CO2 carbon, carbon dioxide intensive way of uh, producing hydrogen. So for example, uh, refineries, uh, traditional fuel production, uh, but even uh, what we call the hard to abate sector, namely steel or cement production, their hydrogen can, can play in the near future really a vital part in helping uh, those industries to decarbonize and, and reduce significantly their carbon footprint. So one of the examples we are pursuing in the Energy and Chemical Park in, in, in Rhineland is sustainable aviation fuel, 
where biomass in combination with green hydrogen uh, might be uh, able to produce and in the near future sustainable aviation fuel. It's a really exciting space, but I wonder what are the challenges around producing and making green hydrogen? Because there must, there must be quite a few. There is uh, yeah, perhaps three coming immediately to my mind. So first of all, it's, it's really about the access uh, to affordable, fully renewable green power. So in order to be uh, cost competitive, we need sufficient and affordable green power. So the second biggest issue then around it is the infrastructure. So, so even if there was enough uh, power assets producing the power, somehow you would need to transport this power to the, to the consumer, namely the electrolyzer. So this makes the further development of our grid and, and the grid connection of the asset and uh, the grid co capacity available as, as one of the vital challenges for the near future. The, the third uh, challenge uh, really around the technology as such is uh, the scaling of uh, electrolyzers. So uh, if you think about uh, how old uh, electrolysis is uh, uh, dating back to, to 1800 when Alessandro Volta did in, invent electrolyzers, uh, we are just in recent years really on a, on a massive scaling trajectory. And if you think about 10 megawatt for Refine 1, Refine 2 already uh, being at a scale of 100 megawatt, uh, we do see a significant uh, uh, increase of capacity as well as size of the assets going up to gigawatt scale in the near future. In other words, we need uh, 500 times Refine 1 or 50 times Refine 2 including more power assets, enhanced grid infrastructure and new modes of grid operation to achieve just only the ambition of 5 gigawatt for Germany alone. Give us an idea of the difference in power between 10 megawatts and 100 megawatts. If you think about uh, a passenger car being, being fueled with, with hydrogen, so a, a normal fuel cell passenger car could roughly um, um, drive some 100 kilometers with just a single kilogram of hydrogen. So if you think about Refine 1 having a daily capacity of 40,000 kilograms per day, uh, this refers back to some 8,000 cars being enabled to drive some 500 kilometers on that same day of production. I think you've alluded to it already, but where do you see the future of, of hydrogen going? So uh, there's a couple of, of applications and, and not necessarily niche applications, really uh, major fields where hydrogen will play for sure in the near future a significant role. Is it the one and only silver bullet? No, for sure not. Frank Kieslik, thank you so much for joining us. So lots of progress around green hydrogen in Rhineland. But what about further afield? I'm joined now by Paolo Brunengo, Director of Technology at KBR, who deliver engineering and technology solutions internationally. Nan Liu, Licensing Technology Manager for Blue Hydrogen at Shell. And Dr. Daniel Stewart, Hydrogen Program Manager at National Grid. And I should say National Grid also have their own Future of Energy podcast. Uh, so thank you very much for coming uh, onto our podcast today. And um, Danielle, let's just kick off with you. Why is hydrogen important for industry as well as the person on the street, the consumer? Sure. So in all credible scenarios for us to meet net zero greenhouse gas emissions, which is really important if we want to address climate change, hydrogen is really required in all parts of the energy mix. So there are studies out there that show that smart combination of gas, whether that's hydrogen or bimethane or even abated natural gas, with the electricity system, will help to achieve that affordable path to get there as well. So in particular, hydrogen can support things like variable renewables in the electricity system. So for example, when the wind's not blowing and the sun's not shining, it could help to generate electricity and therefore contribute to that reliable energy system. And when there's days where there's excess renewables, hydrogen could be used to store that energy over days or weeks or months. Hydrogen could play a role in decarbonising industry, power, transport or even our homes. So at the point of use, hydrogen doesn't produce carbon emissions and that's really good for the environment as it helps reduce local air quality issues and helps us address climate change too. I want to come on to the colours of hydrogen because this is really what the kind of focus of this podcast is about. Um, and I think it's an area that's perhaps less discussed, particularly 
in you know the mainstream media and when we read about hydrogen. So today, more than 99% of hydrogen globally is grey hydrogen, and that's grey hydrogen is often produced in a similar way to, to blue hydrogen, except that the CO2 is emitted into the atmosphere. It feels like a big mountain to climb to convert to green hydrogen made from renewables, given where we are today. Nan, your thoughts? Yeah, that's a really great question. I mean, uh, green hydrogen production from fossil fuel, uh, that is what uh, our industry is uh, familiar with. So we use hydrogen as feedstock for chemical processes. So indeed, it makes sense to ca- add carbon capture, uh, carbon capture and storage, CCS, to existing hydrogen manufacturing process and make uh, the hydrogen blue. So an example is the Pernice refinery that we have in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. So the, high, uh, the CO2 from the hydrogen manufacturing unit is already captured, and we are using the CO2 to fast track uh, uh, vegetable growth in the gro- greenhouses. And now we are going to uh, store it permanently underneath the, the North Sea. In terms of hydrogen, we discuss hydrogen on this podcast. Um, a few years ago, we, we talked about fuel cells. Um, what's changed over the past few years in terms of technology in, in relation to hydrogen? Paolo, if you can pick up and then um, anyone else who'd like to you know, give us their thoughts as well. So technology has developed incredibly in terms of the efficiency of producing the hydrogen and consuming the hydrogen. First is using less energy to produce the energy, the uh, hydrogen, and then to consume less hydrogen to produce energy. That is fundamental because, of course, by improving the overall uh, efficiency cycle, you make feasible something that was originally not feasible. That, I would say, is the major improvement. The second major aspect that has really changed over the year is the generation of the renewable energy from solar and wind. That uh, over the last 10 years, 20 years, we saw that becoming from something that was uh, non-competitive to something that competes today with the generation of uh, electricity from natural gas or even uh, from coal. Daniel, I'd love to hear your thoughts. So we're looking at it in industries, we're looking at it in people's homes. So we're, we're seeing the development of things like hydrogen boilers in people's homes. Um, we're starting to see you know, a lot more focus on networks. So if I speak about some of the things that National Grid's doing, uh, we're very much looking at the impact of hydrogen on our existing assets. So we have a project called Future Grid where we're taking some of the existing assets from our network that we no longer need. We're pulling them together and we're creating a mini transmission network and we're starting to put blends of hydrogen through that network to really understand how it behaves so that we can then work out where the infrastructure changes need to happen and where the technology advances really need to happen. Now, I want to come back and talk about blue hydrogen and relation to CCS, because I think it's sort of worth a, a bit more exp- exploration in this discussion. What's happening in, in that space and what's significant in terms of production and volume? Because that seems to be two key areas that all of our guests today have, have brought up. The blue hydrogen development has really taken a fast pace in the last two to three years. I mean, if you see the IEA report, they announced the blue hydrogen uh, projects uh, by 2030 delivers about 9 million tons of hydrogen capacity, which grows more than 10 times than what uh, we have today. And then if you fast track to 2050, the required blue hydrogen volume is 200 million tons, which is another 20 times growth compared to 2030. So the other significant development in the industry is that we are more focusing on carbon capture rate of the blue hydrogen plant. So more and more project announced requires a high carbon capture rate, say above 95%. Uh, and I think that's really key to make the blue hydrogen as a success for the future. So as a matter of fact, we are talking about color of hydrogen, right? So I think people um, are kind of moving away from the color definition of hydrogen. And there's pink and yellow as well, which we haven't even even discussed yet. Yeah, I think typically people use the color, uh, color definition to distinguish the way how hydrogen is made. So if it's coming from renewables, and then you have white electrolysis and then it's green. And then if it's coming from fossil fuel, it's carbon capture and that's blue. But I mean, what matters in the end is really what is the carbon intensity of the hydrogen molecule that you produce. As soon as you hit the, the hydrogen transmission pipeline, then it's the same molecule that you can use it uh, yeah, in the same way. Danielle, do you want to come in here? 
Sure. So I think in the UK, there's really high potential for blue hydrogen production since it has access to aquifers and, and depleted reservoirs and then natural destinations for carbon storage. But the government's hydrogen strategy that was recently published is really taking what it calls a twin track approach. So backing both blue and green hydrogen production. And to Nan's point, they're also putting out a consultation to define the standards for low carbon hydrogen. So moving away from that blue and green um, definition, if you like, and, and starting to talk about low carbon. And in 2022, we should see business models for CCUS finalised too. So there's a lot happening in this space in the UK. Thank you, Danielle. And I think, Paolo, is the focus on Europe or do we see some really good examples from other places too? Uh, no, actually, it's interesting to see that uh, the interest uh, on the um, both uh, blue, green, I would say generally low carbon hydrogen, really it's extended to a number of different uh, uh, countries. And sometimes you can even be quite surprised for instance, a major attention for uh, anything that is low carbon comes in the Middle East. And the Middle East is also quite favoured by the fact that uh, they can uh, easily store the, uh, the CO2 as well. So actually, just very recently, uh, we have been started a project in Oman for a green hydrogen, a green hydrogen and green ammonia, which was quite uh, interesting. Another key area of potential and uh, very active at the moment is Australia, mainly because Australia is very rich in terms of renewable energy, both wind and solar, and is ideally positioned to serve the needs of uh, Korea, Japan, all the North Asia. It is really not just Europe. Europe is definitely very advanced, but is definitely not just Europe. I just want to, I want to finish with, I guess, um, a difficult question to ask, but just um, let's look into our kind of crystal balls. If we were having this conversation and it was the year 2050 and I had said, what's the situation uh, with, with hydrogen? Where are we? I wonder if you could each give me your response in perhaps just a, a short sort of 10 or 20 second answer. Danielle, you go first. I think it will become much more mainstream, so we won't be having some of the conversations that we're having today about cost. We won't necessarily be having the conversations around what's the right solution in the right places, because I think it will be part of a wider energy mix, really integrated with both gas and electricity systems. Nan, your thoughts? I wish one day in 2050, when I'm telling stories to my grandchildren about how mankind fight against climate change, and try all we can to reduce carbon emissions 30 years ago, they will be looking at me and really confused and ask, Nan, what are you talking about? The only emissions by burning hydrogen is water. And Paola, you finished this off. Your thoughts on where we're going to be in 2050? I would say that uh, I would really see pretty much uh, all the buses in London driven with, uh, with hydrogen. Now there are only few, something like seven, I think. But I would say all of them really driven hydrogen. Most of the trucks, I would say. And definitely hydrogen would be the fuel that we think now natural gas. So something that is the national grid that would be probably with mainly hydrogen. And that is the future that uh, I would see. Uh, actually, the present in, the 2020, in 2050. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all so much for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you very much. As we've heard, hydrogen isn't a silver bullet or blanket solution, but it's huge potential to be a widespread green energy source and storage solution means it's almost certainly going to be much more commonplace in our everyday lives over the decades to come. You've been listening to the Energy Podcast brought to you by Shell. And you can find the Energy Podcast on Spotify, Apple and Google. Just hit subscribe and you can listen to the other episodes on all things energy related. The Energy Podcast was produced by Fresh Air Production. And I must remind you that the views you've heard today are those of the people featured and not Shell or its affiliates. I'm Bryony McKenzie. Thank you for listening and goodbye. <laughs>